These are the stunning caves of Meghalaya. Among the longest in the world, they reflect the millions of years of history and evolution of the region. They also hide within their depths the most unique species of fauna. Magnificent natural formations and fossils that go back to the time when Meghalaya was an island surrounded by rough waters. We wind our way through the network that stretches below the Garo, Khasi and Jentia hills in Meghalaya, covering a distance of around 600 kilometers to tell you their story. Meghalaya's caves were formed around 50 to 30 million years ago. In fact, did you know that the period we are living in today is called the Meghalayan age, which runs from 4,200 years ago to the present. This is because these caves helped researchers trace an important phase in the history of the earth. A climatic catastrophe that had a devastating impact on Bronze Age civilizations across the world, including the Harappan civilization 4,200 years ago. In this special trail, we take you deep inside these magnificent caves of Meghalaya. Taking us on this exciting journey is Brian Dermot Karpran Dali from Shillong. Founder General Secretary of the Meghalaya Adventure Association, Brian is one of the pioneers of cave exploration in Meghalaya and has been leading expeditions, documentation projects and research at these caves for the last 30 years. Brian was drawn to the caves around his hometown Shillong from a very young age and wanted to explore them. But it was much later in life, after a successful career as a banker away from home, that he returned and took on this adventurous journey to explore the caves that were always calling him. He takes us through the fascinating story of these caves, the geological wealth they hide within, and how they have helped trace the missing links of the earth and the Indian subcontinent's history. Caves are caves. They are the same in any part of the world. But um, Meghala as such, our caves in Meghala are no less different from other caves in the world. Our caves are very, very beautiful. Some of them are about the best, the most beautiful in the world. In the last 28 years, we have uh, identified about 1,700 caves in Meghalaya. We have explored just over 1,000 and mapped about 600 and 617 kilometers of cave passage. One of India's smallest states, Meghalaya is more famous for having one of the wettest places in the world, Cherapunji. But this abode of clouds that the name Meghalaya refers to was a very different place once upon a time, long ago. This area was a coral island rising from a tropical ocean swarming with life. This was around 150 million years ago. At that time, the Indian landmass, which was part of a supercontinent called Gondwana and connected to Africa, South America, Australia, Antarctica and Madagascar, slowly started splitting up in a process that took millions of years. In fact, the caves of Meghalaya and many other geological wonders of India are an outcome of these many millennia of geographical transformation. It started uh, during the breakup of Gwanda land, uh, during, uh, towards the end of the Jurassic times, about 150 million years ago, when um, the continent split up and the Indian subcontinent split up from Antarctica, from uh, Madagascar and Australia, and drifted on an epic scale collision with the Asian continental mass. At that time, the Meghalaya actually abutted Western Australia and Antarctica. And uh, as he separated from Gwanda land, Meghalaya was 
you know it was a, a high stable rock structural rock block uh caught by precambrian aged rocks like igneous and metamorphic rocks now this here high uh, structural block formed a promontory of land which uh, was surrounded by oceans teeming with crustaceans in effect it means it meant that megalaya was a coral island at that time and limestone was deposited on whatever part was under the sea so over a period of time uh, the, you know the existence the, of megalaya was not an easy and smooth process there was a, a succession of uh, uprising and sinking and over five uh, five um, cycles as the limestone was deposited megala was uplifted in modern times a larger part of uh, megala was uplifted to higher heights which is now the chilong plateau so that is how megala came about now we have, we have got to understand one one thing Uh, why is it that uh, we have so many caves in Meghalaya, whereas we don't have that much caves in the rest of the country? Meghalaya has only about 10% of the estimated limestone in in India, but all the longest, the deepest caves are situated in Meghalaya. Now, there are certain reasons, certain conditions are required for cave cave formation. Uh, the ideal conditions that would be required would be a high grade uh, limestone which be, should be more than 90% calcium carbonate it should be near or or on the surface there should be a lot of rainfall there should be elevation the limestone must be dense highly jointed and preferably thinly bedded and a hot and humid climate and these are the conditions that uh, we have in meghalaya that is the reason that in the indus subcontinent i mean meghalaya is known for caves no other state in india can come a close second caves are not just holes in the ground as uh, a lot of people will think they are very valuable in our lives they constitute a valuable scientific resource for any branch of scientific research especially of the past and in megala they are very distinct in the sense that uh, because there are no other caves in the rest of the country more or less our caves here are probably the only caves that would hold a rich biodiversity of fauna in such conditions with more than 1700 caves meghalaya is a geologist paradise and an explorer's delight within these deep caverns you can find some of the most unique species of cave fauna in the world rich mineral deposits and never seen before natural formations the caves also hide many a secret It was inside this cave, the Krem Mamlu at Cherapunji, that a stalactite was found. A detailed study of it led to the discovery of a mega drought whose effects lasted for 2 centuries between 4200 years to 4000 years ago. This was a period in which the earth saw a major climatic or environmental disaster because of which great urban civilizations were hit. In fact, in this valley civilization cities simply collapsed through research uh, they have been pointed a particular period of 4200 years ago we till 4000 years for a period of about 200 years that there was a severe drought this drought affected uh, the civilizations of the middle east especially the middle east and the subcontinent and the civilizations that were devastated and affected 
where the Syrian, Egyptian, Mesopotamia, Indus Valley civilization, the Greek civilization, Yangtze River Valley civilization, all these civilizations were affected during that period. Now, as you well know, the Earth's time scale is divided into eons and, and eras and, and periods and ages and so on. So the International Stratigraphy for Commission wanted to name this particular period from 4,200 years ago till the present age as a distinct age. Now, research from the ice cores taken in the Arctic, uh, rocks taken from the seabed, and uh, research from uh, stalagmites in caves will reveal the past climate. So in this particular instance, there was a research conducted by a scholar from the University of California. Uh, I was uh, helping him in taking him to Kremamlo. We uh, managed to procure a few stalagmites from there for his research. And one of the stalagmites was dated by carbon dating to be 40,000 years old. And it took a number of years for isotropic analysis that he had to do, uh, which revealed the past climate. And the, the analysis is, is a, a measurement of the ratio of heavy oxygen isotope and light oxygen isotope. The presence of more heavy uh, oxygen isotope will reveal that there was a drought. And that is what happened. This particular research revealed that there was a severe drought during that particular time. Now, the members of the International Stratigraphy Commission, which comprise of geologists and uh, uh, climatologists, had argued, debated about giving a name to this particular period. And eventually, because of the distinct chemical signature that was derived from this stalagmite specimen that was uh, uh, taken from Kremamlo, they had to, they have finally agreed to name this particular age as Magellan age. So today, Kremamlo has become famous because of this. The caves of Meghalaya are mostly made of limestone, though there are some sandstone caves as well. They form a long connected network under the East Khasi Hills, the South Garo Hills and the Jentia Hills. Picking out a few of the most popular ones, Brian tells us what it's like to explore a cave across its length, breadth and depth. Previously, we have identified approximately uh, just a little over 1,700 caves in Meghalaya. The caves in Meghala are quite big, especially for the Indian subcontinent. We have all the longest, the first 20 longest caves, the first 20 deepest caves in India are all in Meghalaya. Now to classify them, I would put them into either a cave is a horizontal cave or a vertical cave. When I say a, vert, uh, a horizontal cave, I mean where the entrance is horizontal, which means you can walk in, or you can swim in, or you can crawl in, or slide in, whatever. Once you're inside, it can become a pitch, which means you have to climb down. Now, a vertical cave is where the entrance is a drop, a shaft, and you need equipment, you need rope techniques to get down. And once you are at a particular level, uh, the cave becomes horizontal. So these are basically the two different types of caves. Uh, with regards to horizontal caves, uh, as I said, the deepest uh, shafts and the deepest uh, caves, vertical range-wise, are in Meghalaya. In, in, in the subcontinent, maybe. And the longest also are in in Megala. Incidentally, uh, we have a, sa a sandstone cave, which is 
presently the longest sandstone cave in the world. This is very significant in the context of the world uh, caving things. I think it will take many, many years for us to uh, discover more and I'm very sure in the next few years we will cross the 2000 mark. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the caves in Magala are very extensive, very long. The longest uh, cave system at the moment is Liatpra, which is just over 31 kilometers long at the moment. And the second is, incidentally, the sandstone cave, which is just over 25 kilometers. You have a number of other caves which are over 20 kilometers. They are vast and it has taken us seven, eight years to explore and map them. Presently, we are exploring and mapping a particular cave, which is at the moment about 11 and a half kilometers. Uh, we do believe that this cave will connect with another cave, which is already over four kilometers. So this cave has the potential of crossing 15 kilometers. Uh, if we are lucky, it could connect to another system which is quite nearby, and that system is already over 20 kilometers. So who knows, we could end up with a 50 kilometer long cave system. So the potential is vast. Only time will tell. With regards to vertical caves, our deepest cave is 317 meters in vertical range. And that is Krim uh, Sinrang Pamyang. With regards to shafts, the deepest shaft, which means one straight drop, is Zongkur. It is 142 meters deep. So one would have to go down on a rope using single rope technique. So in a sense, if one is to be a caver, he must be a climber, he must be a diver. Now, why I say a diver? Because uh, there's a lot of water inside caves. Now, we cannot uh, enter any cave during the monsoons. And the only period that one can enter and explore caves would be from November till April. That's the, the dry time of the year. Even during this time, there's a lot of water and a lot of swimming is necessary. We have a cave that is more than 20 kilometers long, Krem Chimpe, and uh, you would require about four kilometers of swimming section in this particular cave. And they're very, very deep waters. Anything from four meters to uh, 11, 12 meters deep. And this is the cave I was telling you, if we are lucky, could connect to another system and it could be really something that we would look forward to. A uh, cave is a scientific resource, again here, because caves have got a constant temperature throughout the year. So it is, becomes a re repository of bones. You have fossils. So it is of importance to the paleontologist it's important to the anthropologists also because uh, if you look back to Neanderthal man, the skull was discovered in the cave. And again, in not very long ago, I think it was 2000, 2002 maybe, uh, in Indonesia, in a particular cave, they discovered hundreds of bones to be uh, bones of a new hominid, which are very short, people just about three feet high. So they're very important. They, you see anything that um, is swept into a cave or dies inside a cave would be well preserved for more time than it would be outside the surface. In Krem, we have discovered uh, a particular sh whale bone in a particular cave. We have discovered shark tooth also in a few caves. And in Krempuri, we have discovered fossils of uh, uh, the bone of uh, Mosasaurus, which, which is a marine dinosaur. Now, these are very, very important. 
they will take you back to those times when this region was you know during the jurassic period when these animals were roaming and uh, of course now separated by thousands of kilometers away from the other continents in that sense megala is very rich in its natural and archaeological heritage assets and megala has a diverse biodiversity especially of cave fauna and here in our expeditions we have documented a number of cave fauna that are not found anywhere else in the world except in a few caves in meghalaya some of these cave uh, fauna will include fish like uh, the sistura uh, papillifera which is blind white has very extra sensory and uh, feelers we have also documented uh, sistura larkatensis uh, another spider also not found anywhere in the world as heteropoda fisheri uh quite recently in 2018 you must have read in the papers you must have seen national geographic bbc giving you news about the largest cave fish in the world and that was discovered in a cave in meghalaya so we are still discovering many many more species and what is the importance of this of documenting such cave fauna well you can well understand uh it gives a better insight into the evolution of life because cave life is such because they live in such hostile environment where is where there is absolute darkness so they don't have any need of eyes so over generations they have evolved and uh, they don't have any more eyes so instead of uh, seeing they feel around and so they must have extra sensory hairs or antenna or feelers and because of no pigmentation or sunlight they are mostly white in color another famous cave would be a krem sindai it is famous because it has been described by walters in 1820 as the brahmin cave of silhet now during the times of uh, the jaintia rajas they used this cave as a hideout for the families during times of war uh, it's quite an easy cave a very beautiful cave and every everybody knows about it another very famous and important cave would be siju dobakhau this cave was first uh, discovered in 1875 by mr sanderson who was on an elephant hunt when he came upon this huge entrance to the cave he entered spent the whole day inside the cave and um, at the end of uh, before he started to come out he left a message in a bottle at a distance of about 1190 meters now this bottle was retrieved 47 years later in 1922 by Kempen Chopra why uh, siju the dobakhal is so important so famous is because kempen chopra had uh, they had organized a huge international huge interdisciplinary expedition into this cave in 1922 they are uh, they were from the calcutta museum at that point of time they were explored about 1200 meters inside using boats uh using lanterns they caught uh, and collected more than 1000 bugs and beetles and uh gave it uh, life and they have and the documentation is quite vast it's a huge volume on the cave fauna of siju cave it is the only huge scientific expedition that was conducted in the indian subcontinent uh so for the to that effect siju is known all over the world it is not 
really a very big cave. It is 4.7 kilometers. As I said earlier, they had explored about 1200 meters. So when we started exploring this cave in 1992 and um, 94, 95, we had uh, increased the length. We left the, the survey done by Kempen Chopra and continued from there. The cave is presently 4.7 kilometers long. Uh, in the standards of Megalan Caves, it is not very large, but it is very famous. Besides these caves, there are a few more caves. Um, uh, Kremlinput, because of uh, uh, it was uh, first um, uh, first explored in 1827 by Captain Jones, and then in 1828 by by Walters. Uh, again, they have only uh, explored just uh, I think 1600 meters, 1600 seven meters. Uh, when we uh, uh, discovered this cave, went to the cave and we explored, we have further explored it and mapped it. It is now 6.5 kilometers long. There are many other caves, of course, but then they come in their own, you know, you know different uh, importance. But basically, these are the few very important caves that one would, you know, tell you about. For years, these caves have drawn researchers and scientists from across the world. But they are as special for the people of Meghalaya, who share a unique bond with them. Earlier, locals saw these caves as mysterious passages and holes where people feared to venture. For some, these caves are still home to ghosts and legends, while others have gone inside them for fishing. Interestingly, at one point, these caves were also used as hideouts during wars. But it was from the times of the British that these caves started getting the attention they deserved. The earliest documented caves in Meghalaya go back to the early 19th century. Caves would have been known to exist. People who were living then, many, many hundreds of years ago, would know about the existence of some of these caves because no one would miss them because of the large entrance. Some of them have got very huge entrances. So the caves would be known by the local people. And those people would have entered some of these caves out of curiosity or they would want to go in to catch bats or they would want to go in to catch fish. But normally uh, they would not really be happy to go into caves, especially deep inside, because fear of the dark, fear of unknown uh, presence. Well, uh, I could uh, describe Krem Marai. Well, it is not really a cave as such. It is just uh, a cleft within uh, granite boulders. But it is famous because uh, it is not far from Shillong. It is famous because of the legend and uh, there was supposed to be a damn beautiful damsel or a fairy residing in, in this cave. And uh, people, men rather, would try to entice her out because she was very beautiful, but could never do so until one man uh, took a bunch of flowers and tempted her out. And that's how he caught her. And uh, she got married had children and eventually she went back to the cave and never came out. So this is legend associated with that cave and it's quite famous. Everybody knows about it. Uh, as I said earlier, the first uh, recorded, uh, uh, reported of, uh, of a cave, report of a cave was of uh, a cave in uh, Sendai, described as Cavern Brahmin Cave of Silhet by Walters in 1820. Later on in the early 90s, in the early 20th century, there were casual visitors uh, who had visited the cave, uh, again out of curiosity, they're mostly British officers or 
Indian researchers. And it was uh, later on in the year 19, 1980, 1981, I think it was, Daniel Gaboa, a German gave up, visited Megala and discovered some of these caves. Now he later on joined with our team. Uh, the Megala Adventures, Adventures Association came to, into, the, uh, into the field of caves in 1992. Well, as I said, uh, you would find records of some of these caves in Bengal gazetteers in the early 19th century, okay, during the British times. Uh, the local people, the Khasis, do not have uh, a script at that time, so there was no written record or history, okay? It was only when the British came and Thomas Jones introduced the English alphabet and that's how the Khasi script came about and that's when uh, literature started to come. So it was only in the 19th century beginning of the 19th century during the British times. Before that, there was no record at all. Of course, as at present, uh, the, we have been documenting, as I said earlier, and we have been publishing uh, records of our discoveries. We have uh, a number of books with surveys of these caves. Unfortunately, many of these caves are in grave danger and the threat could come from two, two sources, basically two sources. That would be the cement factories that, op that operate in that particular area. They would be mining limestone in that area. So mining limestone means they would remove the limestone. They would have a quarry and remove the limestone. So in effect, they would remove the roof of the cave and totally destroy the cave. There have been a lot of instances where we have, we have beautiful caves that we have already documented, but now they are not in existence anymore because of this limestone quarry, because of the cement plants. Uh, coal mining is another factor that also destroys the caves because getting to the coal, they would, they would dig, dig deep shafts, mine deep down into the earth, and they would uh, penetrate the roof of the cave and that's how a particular area of a cave would be damaged. Now when they mine the coal, bring it out, they will leave them in heaps and because of the heavy rains, uh, acid will be leached out uh, in terms of uh, like uh, sulfuric acid. Now this sulfuric acid would get into streams and uh, many of the streams would go into caves. So if this acid would get into a particular cave, and if the cave happens to have a rich bi biodiversity of life, like cave, cave uh, fish, etc., then you can be sure that uh, overnight, that particular species will be exterminated. This, this is the sad part, and this is what is happening. Rampant, it is going on in Giant Hills, where we have most of the caves in Meghalaya. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, nobody seems to be willing to look into the aspect of preserving and conserving these caves because of the rich dividends that they are reaping. So, in effect, I can say that because of man's greed, we overlook, you know, we try to destroy, which would be of benefit to us and to our future generations. Well, we do our best to create an awareness whenever we go to a particular region for exploration. This is what we meet the elders, we meet the headman, we meet the denoy of the region. We speak to them, talk to them. Uh, we especially get the young, the youth, into the picture because they are the future generation. But, uh, you know, even these things don't help in the sense that uh, if the village is opposed to, to limestone quarrying or, or uh, coal mining in a particular region, 
uh, they can't put a stop to it because uh, there are vested interests. They're coal barons or coal mafias. They would have their way of getting uh, license, of getting permission, and they would go ahead and do what they want. So th these are the problems that we would be facing in Meghalaya. Now, uh, an example I would give you is of Krem Mamlo. Now, just near the entrance of Krem Mamlo, there is a cement plant, which has been ex in existence for the last 70 years. It started somewhere in the early 1960s. Now, they have been mining limestone over the top of the cave. Now, can you imagine, for 70 years, they've been mining limestone from the top of the cave. You can just imagine the condition of the cave at the moment. There has been a roof cave. Uh, the cave is not very stable at the moment. And the sludge from the factory goes into the cave. So we have uh, tried for the last uh, 20 years, we've been trying to make people aware, put a stop to it. But it's, uh, it's more or less a government undertaking and, uh, you know, it continued. No one would listen. A lot of people are depending the livelihood on the cement plant. So it has been going on. And then um, till uh, it, the cave became famous because of Megalan age. So we thought that uh, the government would do something about it, put a stop to it. But uh, still, you know, the limestone quarrying is still going on. Anyway, in the meantime, we had uh, been able to get to the village, get to the elders, get to the youth. And uh, the youth have formed uh, a society uh, for tourism. And we have been helping them. So to that extent, they have been able to look to stop more damage to the cave. We have uh, gotten in contact with elders and uh, probably now they are feeling that uh, this cave has to be conserved. Uh, we hope so. At the moment, uh, the factory is not doing well, so mining has been stopped, but it could uh, gather momentum at any time, we don't know. But now, at least there has been some awareness. People are beginning to realize that, uh, especially the youth, that they are deriving more benefits out of tourism, out of cave tourism. So we hope that this cave will be preserved. But um, in other areas, I don't know. I mean, it, it is going out of hand. I just hope and pray that, you know, the government realizes its own responsibility and that's something to put a stop to it. I don't say that you put a stop to uh, cement plants or put a stop to coal mining, but some responsibility should be brought in so that there won't be too much damage to these caves, which are a great heritage asset to our state, not only to our state, to our country and to the world at large. These caves are a national treasure and they need to be saved. Thankfully, the work by people like Brian and the organizations that he heads is helping create public awareness at the most local level. Responsible tourism will help locals and the state government understand the potential of these caves to earn money and also sustain their upkeep and that of the communities here. This must be done.